Well, good evening and welcome to our Wednesday night prayer and Bible study. Thank you so much for watching. Hope you'll take just a moment and invite somebody to our service this evening, tag them or uh, take just a moment and share the service tonight. If you got any prayer requests or um, uh, things that you want us to be uh, praying for you about, needs that you might have, be sure you drop that in the comment section below and we'll go through and pray for those needs and want to encourage us all to be praying for one another during these uh, difficult times that we're facing as a nation. I've heard some prayer requests this week that have absolutely been heartbreaking. Uh, some of them I'm not at liberty to share, but there's a lot of people that are going through a very difficult time right now. And uh, from folks that have gotten some uh, really difficult news from, from their doctor about uh, their health, some battling cancer and other uh, things like that. And so let's just lift up some of these in prayer tonight. If you're watching, uh, be sure you drop your name there in the comments and give us a hello. And uh, it's always a blessing to go back and read some of those comments. That's always a lot of fun. And again, if you've got prayer requests, if you're just coming on and you want to leave a prayer request in the comments section, please do that. I love to go back through when the service is ended and uh, write down those prayer requests and be uh, so that I can pray for them throughout the week. And uh, so get your Bible tonight and uh, follow me over to the book of Psalms is where we're going to begin. And just keep your Bibles handy as we go through it. I'm excited for people to see uh, the progress that's happening on the building. This has been a very, very productive uh, week and a productive day, especially. All the air conditioning units have been uh, completely installed, uh, both uh, the units outside and the units inside, and uh, the uh, thermostats, all the uh, the duct work is completely done. And then today they finished installing the glass that goes in the large hallway that separates the two buildings. And so the the glass has been installed. All of the glass doors are now installed, uh, which thankfully we're able to close the building up now and lock it. Uh, they started doing tile in the bathroom uh, for uh, the men and ladies bathrooms. So I'm excited to see how that's going to turn out. And then the uh, we've been waiting for the material for the roof uh, that goes on that large hallway. We haven't been able to do any drywall work or anything like that because the roof uh, hasn't been completed and leaks. And so the, all the material finally came in, the doors and the roof material, and uh, they were able to get that installed today. So praise the Lord. It's exciting to see things just rolling right along. Looking forward to people seeing it. Now this Sunday, when we have church again, some of you, before you leave, be sure you take the time to sneak over there and walk through the halls of that new building. And I know you'll really get a blessing out of seeing all of uh, the progress. Let me just mention a word about our services Sunday. I know it's going to be a interesting start back to church, not uh, the way that we would normally have it. Of course, we won't have any nurseries. We won't have Sunday school uh, this week. We won't be running our buses or anything like that. Uh, won't have choir. And uh, so it'll seem a little bit different than what we're used to, but at least it gives us the opportunity to come back and assemble together uh, sing songs, be able to see one another's faces, even though uh, all of you huggers, you won't be able to do any hugging and won't be able to do any handshaking, but at least we get the opportunity to have church. We'll have some, uh, uh, some guidelines that we have to follow when you get to church this Sunday. Our uh, ushers are going to ask you to go ahead and go right in and be seated. And uh, we're going to have to have some social distancing in the uh, church auditorium and families that come together will be able to sit together. People that come in the same vehicle together will be able to sit together and then there'll have to be some space in between people. And, uh, and we'll have to alternate rows. It doesn't mean that a whole row has to be empty, but we'll have to set people in kind of an X pattern. So if you've got a family sitting on the end of one pew, uh, we'll be able to sit someone uh, safely in the, uh, the middle or uh, parts of the, the few, pew in front of them and do kind of a X pattern shape uh, to get folks in the auditorium. If we have overflow and need more space, 
we'll be able to do the same thing in our church fellowship hall. Uh, that gives us plenty of room. And if, and, uh, you know, if you're just, you don't want to be around people, that's where you want to sit this Sunday because it gives you plenty of space in that room. There's a PA system. There'll be plenty of volume and you'll be able to watch from the screen in the fellowship hall if that's what you'd like to do. And so we do have some opportunities there for people who are just maybe a little bit nervous about being in the same room with a lot of folks. But I'm excited about getting back to church this Sunday and uh, we won't be passing the offering plate. That'll be there waiting for you at the back door if you want to give on your way out. When church is over, we're going to dismiss people by row. So that way you don't have to worry about everybody leaving at the same time. And so we're still going to follow some of these safety precautions uh, in days to come. But what a blessing it'll be to see some of your faces again. And uh, I know you've had to look at my ugly face on your TV screens and phones all of this time. But now I get to see your faces. I won't say ugly faces. All right? I get to see your happy, smiling faces uh, this Sunday at church. So anyway, I see uh, folks uh, commenting there and join us. It sure is good to see you. I see uh, there, Miss Elizabeth. I've been praying for you and the, uh, your pregnancy. Continue to pray for um, Josh and Taylor. She's getting very close to baby time for her as well. So be in prayer uh, for her, it could happen at any moment. And I saw her yesterday and I said, do you feel like everybody's just watching you like a ticking time bomb uh, waiting for this baby to come? And she said, yeah, I'm starting to get that feeling. And uh, so just be in prayer for her. Hello, Miss Kim Smith. It's a blessing to see you on here. Been praying for you and uh, looking forward to, to getting to see you again. Uh, maybe not this Sunday, but whenever you feel like it's safe to come back. I know a lot of these ladies sure miss being in Miss Sherry's class, but the good news is when we do get to come back to church, you'll have a new Sunday school class to attend. Thank you for those of you that have been uh, giving through our online uh, portal there at crossroadsgainesville.com. I appreciate all the gifts that have come by and uh, just continue to pray for our building. We still have to raise some money to get this job done. Now that this building is being completed, we've got to move into the next phase of construction, which is our church auditorium. And boy, we still have got to raise money. They've been uh, working on some bids and trying to get all the details together on how much more we're going to need to raise to do the church auditorium. So be in prayer with me about that. And we've got to get this money raised, get this project done. And uh, I'm excited about what uh, the Lord has in store for the future of our church. It really is exciting, the opportunities to start new Sunday school classes, to, you know, to see the juniors in their new junior church, the teenagers in their new youth apartment. I mean, it's just going to be awesome. It's going to be a, 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 an awesome experience. So I'm thankful for that. So you can give online, crossroadsgainesville.com, or you can text to give. Uh, you just text to the number 940-400-4707. And if you want to designate to something in particular, uh, like to the building, you can enter an amount, say 50 building hit send. And that's as simple as it is. And if you've not set up an online account, but would like to, then just text the word give to that phone number, 940-400-4707 text the word give to that number and it'll send you a link where you can be taken right to the uh, in instructions on how to set up a page. So sure appreciate that. Well, we're going to go right to Psalm 78 and I want to give you a thought this uh, evening that uh, maybe you haven't considered before, but this is really uh, going back to the message that I preached Sunday. Remember Sunday morning, I asked the question, is there anything too hard for God? And, and that's a question that God asked Abraham and Sarah. Is there anything too hard for God? Well, we know that there's nothing that's too hard for him. And yet I'm going to read you a verse today that's very unusual and is worth us thinking about. Because maybe you've been wondering, well, I don't think that there's anything too hard for God. And yet, it doesn't seem like God has blessed me or it doesn't seem like God is answering my prayer. Why is that? Well, let's go to Psalm 78 and look with me. Well, let's just look at several passages or several verses in this passage, just so that you can get an idea of what the Lord's talking about here. Okay. Let's just start. Oh, down in verse number, um, 
Let's start in verse number 10. The Bible talking about the children of Israel and, and their experience coming out of Egypt and crossing the Red Sea and going through their time in the wilderness. Uh, notice what God said in verse 10. They kept not the covenant of God. They refused to walk in his law. He's talking about all these, these the times of rebellion. And he's going to list a lot of them here. He said he for, they, they forgot his works and his wonders, which he showed them. Verse 12 said, marvelous things he did in the sights of our fathers in the land of Egypt and the field of Zoan. He divided the sea and caused them to pass through. He made the waters to stand up as in heap. In the daytime, he also led them with a the cloud and the night with a light of fire. He clave the rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink out of the depths. And so he's explaining to them all the ways that he had blessed them, all the ways he had provided for them. He talks about the manna. He talks about the, the miracles with all the water and all the things that God did. But look what it says in verse number 22 or verse 21. Therefore, the Lord heard this and was wroth. So his fire was kindled against Jacob and his anger also came up against Israel. Why? Because they believed not in God and trusted not into, into his salvation though he had commanded clouds above them and opened the doors of heaven and rained down manna upon them and had given them corn out of heaven. Man did eat angels food. All right. I don't, that's your first account of angel food cake in the Bible. Angels food. He sent them meal to the full. God's saying, I provided for you in every way possible. Uh, and yet you get down here and uh, you see in verse number 31 and 32 where they're still sinning against God and they're being stubborn. And uh, they forgot about his compassion. They forgot about all of his works. And then you get down to verse number, oh, let's see here. Verse number 41. Look at this. It says, yea, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. And so I want to ask this question tonight, and it's something for us to all think about. Are you limiting God? Are you limiting God? Father, thank you for our church. Thank you for uh, this opportunity that we can still meet together uh, via technology. And Lord, I just lift up the needs of our folks to you. I know that there are many heavy hearts tonight unspoken request, things that have happened that have literally turned people's whole world upside down and inside out this week. And Lord, we're burdened for them and we uh, we lift them up in prayer to you. And so Lord, I pray that you'd bless the message tonight. Thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for your protection. We pray all these things in Jesus name. Amen. I want to tell you a quick story uh, before I get into the message that happened Sunday night. Uh, Brother Caleb Garraway, many of you know him. He was coming from Temple, Texas, and was going to stay the night in our missions house here uh, in Gainesville. And then he was going to drive on home to Iowa the next morning. Well, on his way from Temple to here, it was around midnight, he's almost to Sanger, probably the first Sanger exit, and a car comes flying up behind him. We're talking probably over 100 miles an hour. And by the time he sees them, they're in his lane and they're about to hit him. He has just enough time. He's driving a 15 passenger van, has just enough time to swerve, but the car still hits him. And at full speed, he starts sliding like this down the interstate. It, I mean, you look at the tire marks, the skid marks. It's a miracle that he didn't roll and start flipping. He slid like this and then eventually hit head on into the concrete barrier that spun him around and crashed the back of his van. Well, the crazy part of the story is the, the two guys that were in that vehicle that hit him, they kept driving. They didn't stop. So when the police got there, another witness stopped. The witness didn't see the wreck happen, but he just felt like telling the police officer, hey, I just want you to know that just a little while ago, this car nearly hit me. I had to do everything in my power. I literally had to run my car off the interstate and into the grass to keep from being hit. And it was that same vehicle. Well, by the time we got Brother Caleb's uh, van up on the wrecker and I started uh, driving him here to Gainesville, uh, the police officer said, we found him. That car uh, 
was damaged bad enough that it, it, it ran all of its fluids out and they tried to ditch the car there at that Lone Oak uh, Drive Shell gas station and they ended up catching those guys. But just goes to show you, man, thank God for his his protection. You know, thank God that he was looking out for Brother Caleb. And that's just another reason why we got to be in prayer for one another. And uh, I was just, uh, you know, hearing stories from that pastor about the good meeting that they had had on that Sunday night. And I told Brother Caleb, I said, man, God, the, the devil is mad. He's trying to take you out, man. And uh, so we got to lift one another up in prayer all the time. So anyway, let me get back to our our uh, message here this evening and on are you limiting God? Now, this is a mystery to me, okay? This is a mystery. Is it possible, knowing that God is almighty, knowing that he's sovereign, knowing that he's the creator of heaven and earth and can do anything that he wants, doesn't it sound a little bit crazy for me to even ask the question, is it possible for men and women to limit God's power? You know, oh, preacher, you just said Sunday, there's nothing too hard for God. But if God's so powerful and if he's so all powerful and he can solve every problem and save any person, then why doesn't God help me? Well, the answer to that question is here in this verse. Because sometimes we can limit God. Look at the verse again. They turned their back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. So we read some examples of this, okay? The nation of Israel, they, they were just constantly demanding that God show off his power, that he show proof of his presence. They never remembered what God did in the past. They never were thankful for the miracles that were happening. They were always just demanding, God, uh, show us again that you can do miracles. Uh, they were always trying to tell God how to do his job, telling him by what methods he was supposed to lead them and provide for them. And folks, we just can't treat God this way. He's God, we're not. He knows what's best and we don't. And the other thing that Israel does as you read this passage is that they begin to limit God to their way and to their time. In other words, saying, God, you have to help us like we are asking and when we're asking, as if though God were somehow naive or set up in heaven, stupid or blind, and couldn't see what their needs were. And that was the attitude that God was dealing with here, okay? So here is the question. Is it possible to limit an all-powerful God? Now, before you just write me off tonight as, as coming across as, as being arrogant or speaking out of line here, just to insinuate that we could possibly stop a sovereign God from doing whatever he wants. And by the way, let me say, friend, God can do whatever he wants. He is almighty. He is all powerful. But I want you to go into your Bibles with me tonight and understand what it is that God means by this passage of Scripture. Turn with me, first of all, to Matthew 27 and verse number 1. Matthew 27 and verse number 1. The Bible says, When the morning was come, the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. So we know that Jesus, at the moment they captured him to be crucified, we know that he had all the power in the universe at his command. He could have done anything that he wanted to do. He didn't even have to lift a finger. He could have spoke the word and destroyed all of his enemies. And yet we see where Jesus allowed the chief priest and elders of the people to bind him and lead him away. Uh, go back one chapter to Matthew 26 and look with me in verse number 51. If you remember when they're there in the garden and that posse shows up to take him, remember what Peter did? He drew his sword and he cut off Malchus's ear. And just for the record, Peter was not aiming for his ear. Peter was trying to probably split the guy's head like a watermelon. 
And so verse number 51 says, Behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. Now listen to what Jesus says here in verse 52. Then Jesus said unto him, Put up again thy sword into his place. For all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father and he shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels? What was Peter doing here? He was trying to do, he didn't think Jesus was doing a good job about handling this situation and he was going to take it upon himself to fix it all on his own. And Jesus said, you know what? Even now, if I wanted to, I could speak the word to my father and 12 legions of angels would come to my rescue. Now I have read where some say that 12, that there are 12,000 angels in a legion. And according to the verse we just read, what Jesus said here would equal 144,000 angels that Jesus could have called on at that moment. Well, in 2 Kings chapter number 19 and verse 35, we see a little bit of perspective about what just one angel could do. If you read 2 Kings 19, you'll see where God sent just one angel and that one angel slew 185,000 Assyrians in one night. That's one angel. Jesus said, if I wanted to, I could call 12 legions uh, uh, of angels to come. And man, like the song said, I just, he could destroy the whole world and set him free, but he didn't do that. So here's what I want you to understand by that. Jesus was not bound because he was helpless. We see all these paintings of Jesus Christ, and they always make him look so feminine and so helpless. They make him look like some long-haired hippie that grew up in the 60s, you know, so effeminate. And all the pictures make him look so helpless. Jesus was never helpless, and he wasn't bound because he couldn't, he didn't have any choice in the matter. He allowed himself to be bound. He could have spoken them into oblivion, but he didn't. Now go over to another passage of scripture with me. Go to John chapter 18 and look in verse number three, John chapter 18. And boy, I hope you have your Bibles handy. I hope that you, uh, that you get very familiar with the word of God. What you do with your Bible is going to determine what God will do with you. You've got to know that book. You've got to love it. You've got to read it. John 18 and verse number three, this is still an account where Jesus is in that garden of Gethsemane with his disciples. And this is when Judas and that posse shows up to try to capture him. Okay, listen to this. This is awesome. Verse three, Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, whom seek ye? And you see how Jesus is totally in control. He knew that they were coming. He knew everything that was going to happen. He was never afraid. He was never panicked. He was never one time anything but a, but a man's man in total control the whole time. In verse four, Jesus, therefore, knowing the things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, whom seek ye? And they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. And he saith unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which was which betrayed him, stood with him. Now look at verse number six. This is incredible. And as soon as he had said unto them, those three words, as soon as he said, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. When the one who spoke this whole world into existence in Genesis 1, with just the sound of his voice, said, let there be light, and there was light, and did everything in creation with just the sound of his voice, when he said, I am, that's his name, that's God's name, 
I am he, they literally all flew backward and fell to the ground. Now, I don't know about you, but if I would have been any of those soldiers or anybody in that posse that night, and God knocked me down with just the sound of his voice, I think I'd have been hightailing out of there. I would have been running for sure. So understand, yes, God is almighty, but we are to understand that it is, that while it's true, there's nothing too hard for God. God told us that we will limit his power in our lives when we behave in ways that displease him. And so we should examine ourselves to see if we're limiting the Lord. So my question to you tonight is this. Are you putting handcuffs on Jesus? Are you putting fetters on Jesus? Jesus wants to bless us. He wants to help. He wants to heal. He wants to minister. He wants to save. But I think that there are some things that we can do as Christians that tie up the hands of Jesus. And let me tell you what those are. You can write them down. They're all uh, one word uh, points tonight. The first thing that limits God is the chain of unwillingness. Unwillingness. Yeah, you will not find anyone in the Bible where God forced himself upon them. He's always let men choose right or wrong, good and evil, and even salvation, he has given us the opportunity to accept or reject his son, Jesus Christ. If you remember in Matthew chapter 23 and verse 37, where Jesus is looking out over the city skyline of Jerusalem from on top of the hill, and he weeps for them. And he says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stoned them that are sent unto thee, how awful would I have gathered thee, or gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Jesus said, I've been crying out to you. I've sent prophets to you. I've tried everything. It's not that I wasn't willing. You weren't willing. Now, let me ask you this. Have you ever tried to help someone who didn't want to be helped? I think we all have, haven't we? I would I would venture out to say this evening, friend, that it's impossible to help somebody that doesn't want to be helped. And sometimes people are just stubborn and they don't want to listen to counsel and they don't want to do anything God's word says. And you say, oh, Brother Randy, I, you know, I feel like I've gotten into a difficult place in my life and I there's some things that, I've, uh, that I'm ashamed of and there's some areas that I need help. Let me just say something to you tonight, friend. It's not a shame to need help. It's a shame to need help and not be willing to get help, okay? There's a lot of people that that come to me and say, Preacher, I need help with my marriage, but my husband's not willing to talk. My husband's not willing to sit down and get any counsel. Uh, my wife's not willing to do, you know, there's unwillingness. And when we're not willing to let God help us, God says, okay, you keep doing it your way. But when you want my power, it's available, but you're going to have to humble yourself. Are you willing to have a conversation about your drinking problem? Are you willing to have a conversation about some of those areas in your, in your life that's been hurting your family, hurting your marriage, hurting your children? When you're ready for help, God is all powerful, but he expects us to be willing. That prodigal son that you read about in Luke 15 he was stubborn. He didn't want any advice from his dad or anybody else. And so he decided to run and his dad had to turn him loose for a while. And it took him losing everything that he had. And it took him having to go to a hog pen and eat, eat the, the, the same slop that the pigs were eating before he finally came to himself and was ready to be helped. And it's the same way with God. God wants to give peace. He wants to give comfort and hope and security and even salvation, but we must be willing. There's nothing too hard for God, but he will allow us just like he did those Roman soldiers 
He will allow us to bind and chain him through our unwillingness. I believe with all my heart that there are times, there have been times even in my own life when God has wanted to bless me and you. And it's not that he cannot, he will not because we will not, we're unwilling. The second chain that I want to mention to you tonight that limits the power of God is the chain of unconcern, unconcern. Uh, sometimes it's not that we're not, uh, that, that we're unwilling. Sometimes it's just that we're completely indifferent. You know, it's like the, 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 the teacher that asked her little uh, class, she said, somebody tell me what apathy means. And the little boy raised his hand and he says, I don't know and I don't care. All right, that's apathy. I don't know and I don't care. And sometimes that's how we go about the Christian life. In Revelation chapter three, uh, we see the letter to the church at Laodicea. They were a lukewarm church. They had everything they could have ever wanted. They were blessed in all kinds of ways. And yet they just had a who cares attitude about the will of God. And Jesus writes to them in, in Revelation three and verse number 20. And he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and we'll sup with him and he with me. Jesus said, I'm knocking on the door of this church. I want to come in. I want to help. I want to bless. But he said, you're not willing to open. And you know what? There are so many people today that are so consumed and so busy and so concerned with everything else in the world that they never even care to hear the voice of Jesus Christ. We got to be careful. And maybe this is what coronavirus has taught us. That you know what? Let's not get our priorities so out of whack that we lose our concern about doing the will of God. You say, Brother Randy, can God do anything? Yes. It is not that he cannot do something. It is that he will not if we are unconcerned and will not open the door to him and will not invite him and his blessing back into our life. Uh, listen, wh where are the Christians today, like the days gone by, who are genuinely concerned about God's work? Uh, where are the believers today who their passion is for winning souls to Christ? I'm not just uh, here to pick on you this evening with this message, but I want to ask you, when's the last time you were ever concerned about a lost soul? When's the last time you told somebody about Jesus Christ? or handed somebody a gospel track. I'm telling you, God is willing to save, and God is willing to do great things, and God is willing to take our churches to levels and heights that we could never even comprehend, but it's never going to happen, and souls are never going to be won, and lives are never going to be changed unless God's people are concerned about his great commission. Who's concerned? about the same things Jesus is concerned about. I remember years ago, Brother Boyd telling a story about a revival meeting that he had just had. And Brother Boyd, every time he would go to a church, he would sit down with the pastor and they would set goals for what God, what they wanted God to accomplish that week. And he would have preacher boys with them. And all throughout the week, those preacher boys would go soul winning and they would run buses and they would bring kids in and have junior church and they would preach to teenagers and they would do everything in their power that week to get people saved and baptized and folks to join the church. And it was not uncommon for Brother Boyd to leave a revival meeting with a thousand people saved and hundreds of people baptized. But he came home one time and he told a story about a meeting he had just been in. And he said, when I got there, the pastor said, now, Brother Boyd, we know that you really like to go after souls, but this week, we're not going to run all those programs. We're not going to do all that soul winning. This week, we're just going to, we're just going to pray them in, brother. We're just going to pray them in. And so Brother Boyd said, you know what? I respect the pastor. I'll do what you say to do. This is your church. And every night, Brother Boyd would go to that service, would go to that prayer meeting, and they would pray for souls to be saved. At the end of the revival meeting, 
the pastor comes to Brother Boyd and he's just disappointed. Brother Boyd, I just thought we would have more people saved than what we had saved this week. I'm just kind of disappointed that we didn't have more people uh, getting baptized and joining the church. And this is what Brother Boyd told them. He said, Preacher, the reason why it didn't happen is because all week we were sitting around praying and asking God to do what he commanded us to do. And God has commanded us to go. He has commanded us to preach it, to spread it, to get the good news of the gospel out. I'm looking forward to things getting back a little bit more to normal at our church. And I'm looking forward to Christians learning the blessing of soul winning and getting out and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Unconcern, change the hands of God. The third chain is this the chain of unreasonableness. You didn't know I could say a word that long, did you? Unreasonableness. If you look in Romans chapter 12 and verse number one, the Bible says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. Listen to this. Holy acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. He didn't say it was unreasonable. He said it's reasonable service. After all, he died for us. He shed his blood for us. And he goes on to say, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So let me just say, friend, tonight that it is not unreasonable. For God, who is the king of our life, he is the Lord of our life. It is not unreasonable for the one we call king, the one we call master and Lord, it is not unreasonable for him to demand that his people live holy, godly lives. It's not unreasonable that he demand we not be conformed to this world. He said, oh, Brother Randy, when are you going to make that church look more like a, light, a nightclub? Never. Because I'm not trying to attract the world. I'm trying to, uh, to, to, to please the Savior. We're not trying to have a seeker-sensitive uh, church, seeker-friendly church. We're trying to have a Savior-sensitive church, all right? I don't have to have a rock concert uh, to get people saved. I don't have to uh, uh, go to the world for their ideas. This old book, it still works and has never lost its power. It's not unreasonable when the Bible says to be renewed. God wants us to change our way of thinking, be different. Now, uh, listen, I, I thank God that he's allowed me to, uh, to pastor a Baptist church. Uh, I'm not afraid of Bible terms. Uh, I'm not ashamed of the name Baptist. I'm a Baptist because the Bible makes me a Baptist. But let me just tell you something. If you go and you check out Baptist history, you'll find something about it. Baptists have always been separatists, always. And God is a serious separatist. And he wants his people to live lives that are totally different from this old world. Uh, that's why he tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, he says, wherefore come out from among them. Who? from the world, from the drunks and the drug addicts and the, and, and, and the, the God haters and the God cursers. And he said, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. Uh, that's what a church is. It's an ecclesia. It's a called out assembly. You go back to the Old Testament days, you'll see where God called out the nation of Israel as his chosen people. And he told them in Leviticus 20, he said, you shall be unto me, a, uh, uh, you shall be holy unto me, for I, the Lord, am holy and have severed you from other people that ye should be mine. That word severed there is really interesting, isn't it? When I hear the word severed, I think of something that's been cut off. And Jesus told the nation of Israel when he started laying out all of those laws in Leviticus and all the things that 
they could do and could not do and all the things that made them unique in the world as a people. He said, I want you to understand that I have severed you from the rest of the world because you belong to me. He's all oh, brother Randy, all that's well and good. And all that's, you know, all that old Testament stuff about those old Testament Jews. That's great. But what does God think about the church in the new Testament day? Well, here's something you need to understand. God's opinions doesn't change. If he felt something special for his people back then, he still feels something special for us today. Now, we are not the nation of Israel, and the church has not replaced the nation of Israel. But we are bought by his blood. We are a peculiar people. He, we belong to him. He owns us. He says in Titus chapter 2 and verse number 11, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men. What a great verse. But that same grace of God in verse 12 says that it teaches us denying ungodliness and worldly lust. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. So God says it is not unreasonable to expect that Christians live different than the world. And the world should be able to tell that, you know what, we don't just live one way on Sunday and then the world see us behave another way on Monday. God's people should live different lives. Peculiar, God says. That simply means that we're one's own. So when we are not willing to do these things, God says we're being unreasonable. And how in the world can we expect God's power in our life when we won't do our reasonable service, okay? The fourth thing for you to remember tonight is this, and we're almost through. The fourth thing that can chain the hands of Jesus Christ is the chain of uncleanness, uncleanness. In other words, sin in our life can keep God from blessing us uh, and working with us and using us. I mentioned the verse last Sunday in Isaiah 59 and verse 1, where God says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But verse 2 says this, But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. So in other words, when we allow sin to go unconfessed and unrepented of, it can keep the good things that God wants us to, to have from happening. When we live every day bitter, we're only hurting ourselves. When we go day after day with unforgiveness or animosity or jealousy or envy, when we get rebellious, we're only hurting ourselves. All we are doing is limiting. We are putting a limit on what God could do with our life. But he says, I won't. I won't as long as uh, you remain stubborn about it. Maybe you remember hearing the story of that little boy whose parents uh, saw him. He had his hand stuck down in that, that vase, you know, and they were trying to pull his hand out of that expensive vase. And he just, man, he had his, his hand clenched up in a fist and he just... That if you would just let go of that fist, we could get your hand out of the vase. Well, he wouldn't do it. And they finally had to break the vase and to get his hand out. And his mom said, okay, now open up your hand. I want to see what was so important that we had to break this vase. And he opened up his hand and you know what it was? A penny. A penny. What? <laughs> we broke a vase because you wanted to hold on to a penny. But you know what? The same plays out in our life. We would rather bind the hands that want to comfort and bless us and save us and heal us. All because there's an area of our life, something that we don't want to let go. And the last thing is this. Thanks for sticking with me tonight. The last thing is this. The chain of unbelief. Now, everything else that I've mentioned tonight. This is the worst. 
unbelief more than anything else limits the Almighty. All sin is terrible. We know that. But this sin is especially devastating. Something interesting is mentioned in Matthew chapter 13 and verse number 58. It said that Jesus did not many miracles there because of what? Their unbelief. Now, Jesus had already healed blinded eyes. He had given uh, uh, hearing back to the deaf. He had made the lame walk. We even saw, you, you read the, the chapters leading up to this, and he had raised a 12-year-old girl from the dead. And yet this verse said that he could not do many works there because of their unbelief. That's unbelievable. Everywhere else, he performs miracles. But in his hometown, unbelief prevented him from doing what he could have done. I remember a woman coming up to me at one of my revival meetings and she had something, some need that she just felt like God needed to answer that prayer before the week was over. And she asked me if I'd pray with her about it. And, uh, you know, we talked about it throughout the week and she said, this has just got to happen. God has got to hear this prayer. Well, at the end of the revival meeting, she came up to me and she could, I mean, I could tell she looked disappointed. She looked upset about something. And she came to tell me that God hadn't answered that prayer. But this is what she said. Not only did she tell me that God hadn't answered her prayer, she said, but you know, it's okay. Because I knew God probably wasn't going to answer it anyway. And I said, ma'am, it sounds to me like God gave you what you expected. When we don't believe God's word, when we don't have faith in God, when we pray, when we pray like that woman and say, you know what, God, I know you're probably not going to do this anyway. What do we expect? We must believe that Bible enough to say, God, I put my faith and trust that your word is right. And I believe that you're going to answer the prayers. So God can do anything he wants, but faith is the channel. It's the channel through which our Lord pours his life into us. Unbelief. Are you limiting God through unwillingness or unconcern or just being unreasonable? How about uncleanness or unbelief? These are the ways the scripture tells us it's possible for us to miss God's best for our life, where we are limiting the Holy One of Israel. How foolish that we would miss our opportunity. Well, thanks for tuning in tonight. Hope the message was a help and a blessing to you. And uh, think on some of the things that have been mentioned tonight. And say, God, I, I need an answer to prayer, or I need your power, or I want you to, uh, I, I need your fullness in my life. And Lord, I don't want anything to limit what you have in store for my life. I want the fullness of your blessing. Let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Father, thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for those that have joined us for our service tonight. I hope that it's been a help and encouragement to them. Lord, I pray that you'd bless us this coming Sunday as we prepare for in-person services once again at Crossroads Baptist Church. Lord, I pray that you would use us, help us as we uh, start slowly, uh, little by little over the next weeks and months. Uh, getting things back to somewhat normalcy. And Lord, we just want to do great things for God. Help us to win souls. Help us to be a church, Lord, that's a lighthouse on the hill for the lost. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, church. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. Hope it was all a blessing to you and have a good week. I don't want anybody to feel obligated to come to church that doesn't feel safe being at church. Please, please, please understand that. And uh, But if you're able to come, you're welcome to come and uh, wear a mask if that makes you feel comfortable. But uh, be in prayer about this weekend. God bless you. Have a good night.